My name is Megan Jones Patterson, and I'm on the board of Colorado Field Ornithologists as the membership chair. Um, and we're incredibly excited that Colorado and CFO and other organizations here in Colorado are going to be joining the Pinion Jay Community Science Project that's you know, been headed up by Great Basin Bird Observatory and has been occurring across other states. And we're excited to be able to host that and also to learn a lot more about it uh, today from John Boone. Uh, before we get into that, I just wanted to say, I know many of you are members. A lot of memberships are coming up due at the end of the year. So if you wanna renew your membership, it would be great to see that happen uh, to support the work that we're doing and, and provide more opportunities. Um, I also want to take the time to thank the, the subcommittee of the CFO Conservation Committee that has been putting together a lot of the collaborative work to make sure this project is happening here in Colorado. That includes Philip McNichols, Chuck Hundermark, Pat Cullen, Amy Walsh, and Scott Summershoe. So I appreciate all the work that they have put into getting this set up. Um, and a little bit about how this meeting is going to run. So in a second, I'm going to turn it over to John. He's going to tell us more about the project and how we can participate in it. Um, I'm excited to learn those details. There'll be a question and answer at the end. So feel free to put your question into the chat if you want to throughout the presentation or hold on to it and we'll, we'll go through questions at the end of the presentation. Um, if you can leave yourself on mute during the presentation, that will be great. Uh, if at any point you're having a hard time with the audio and you have your video on, you may want to try turning your video off to, to reduce the streaming. You'll have, get audio better. Um, and with that, I just wanted to, uh, oh, the other thing is if anything comes up and you have any technical difficulties during the presentation, go ahead and send a message to either myself or to Linda Lee, who's one of the other co-hosts, and we'll try to help troubleshoot those technical difficulties while the presentation's going on. Um, so without, um, or I want to go ahead and introduce John now. So John grew up in North Carolina, um, but came out to Colorado for his PhD work uh, in environmental population organismal biology here at, uh, at UC Boulder. Um, he spent the first 10 years after of his postgraduate career working on a variety of topics, particularly with mammals, with research focused on ecology of zoonotic diseases, predominantly hantavirus across the Western US. He eventually switched to birds and began working for Great Basin Bird Observatory. Um, and while he's there, John has led and contributed to nearly 100 different applied conservation initiatives, population monitoring programs, and conservation planning initiatives throughout the Western United States. Projects have included radio telemetry studies of pinion jays and greater sage grouse, nest monitoring of golden eagles, and research to improve methods of monitoring elf owls along the lower Colorado River. In recent years, much of his work has focused on pinion jays, monitoring of pinion juniper woodlands, and mortality monitoring of renewable energy sites. And one of his current projects is, you know, coordinating this, this new initiative or newish initiative of community science. So with that, I want to turn it over to John and welcome him to Colorado <laughs> for the project to Colorado. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's nice to be back in Colorado, if only virtually. Um, it's been a number of years since I've been back in person, but hopefully soon one of these days. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you to CFO for your interest in this project. It's really a, a, a matter of great excitement to us to have uh, you folks involved and we hope it'll be a, a great experience for you and we're sure it will contribute to this uh, newly emerging very important topic of pinion jay conservation. So with that said, I am going to share a screen here. Give me just a moment to find the right screen. Uh, somebody will need to, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So Megan or somebody will need to uh, make me the host. There we go. All right, I think this is this is the right screen. Okay. All right, you should be Megan. Are you seeing a shared screen? Yes, we are. Very good. So I thought I would uh, give you this introduction into the initiative. Um, and I'll start by doing that by asking a few fairly obvious questions. And the first among these is why pinion jays, of course, 
We all know that they're an interesting and an unusual bird, but really the, the reason why the community science effort is so important and so timely is illustrated here on the bottom left of this screen. And that's a depiction of a population trend of pinion jays range wide, according to breeding bird survey data over the last uh, five or six decades. And you can see what that looks like. It's, it's, it's troubling, it's very sobering, declines continuing to this day. Um, and the interesting thing is we don't really know exactly what's driving declines of this magnitude. There are certainly theories, there's certainly informed speculation, but it's a little bit of a mystery in that there's certainly lots of pinion juniper woodland still out there. Another interesting thing about this trend is that despite how um, drastic it's been for a long, long time, interest in pinion jay conservation is only really gathering steam the last several years. And for many of the years illustrated by this trend, um, it was close to absent. So uh, this is the driver right here, concern about these trends and the fact that they're continuing. This has led among other uh, outcomes and, 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 and uh, happenings to a petition to the Fish and Wildlife Service to list the species under the Endangered Species Act. This is under review currently and a preliminary finding I, I think is expected um, any day now. Scott Summershoe would have, probably have better information, but he's playing it close to the vest, understandably. Um, but that's why pinion jays. So the next question, um, not why pinion jays, but why community science? And I think you guys probably already sense the answer to this question, but I want to lay it out a little bit more in terms of the role that community science has traditionally played um, and the role that it can play now and in, in this newer era. And uh, as an aside, we use the term community science for several reasons, but it's really interchangeable with the more commonly used uh, term citizen science. So traditionally, you know, we have formal field work, formal surveys, the advantage of those being their standardization, the, the fact that they can be um, employed um, in conjunction with a formal sampling design or study design. But of course, they cost money and we're always limited with regard to the extent to which these more formal, more expensive surveys can be performed in the landscape. Community science, on the other hand, is far more cost efficient in that it utilizes volunteer labor, but it's more difficult to, to kind of um, um, get to adhere to a, to a more formalized um, sort of design and uh, implementation standards. Another advantage of, of community science, of course, and one that's not stressed often enough in some circles, I would say, is the fact that it offers a mechanism for a broader set of people to become engaged in the conservation issues that surround them and the ways that their landscapes are managed. Now, traditionally, these two things have always existed for a long time, but they've kind of been in separate boxes to some extent. Over the last number of years, like maybe even decade and a half, uh, people have come up with uh, many more new and clever ways to take these two different kinds of data and meld them together into an integrated analysis that really gives us the best of both worlds. And this is becoming increasingly important, I think, because our need for information about pinion jays is profound right now. There's a hunger for it. There's a emerging interest in their conservation, but there's really not as much information available about their ecology, their habitat use, their threats, as you would think there would be for a species that's been declining for decades. So in many ways, we're trying to catch up and you know, um, utilizing this sort of synergistic approach where we, where we utilize more formal survey work and community science together will get us to where we need to be considerably faster than we would get there otherwise. Now, a question that gets asked oftentimes um, when we talk about community science and pinion jays is why don't people just collect pinion jay data in eBird? It's an excellent question with what we think is a good answer, but I'll preface that answer by saying there is absolutely no reason why you should not continue to put your observations into eBird. Um, the problem is not 
and anything's wrong with eBird, it's great. It's just that with regard to this species in particular, eBird has some limitations that, that are potentially important. Uh, the first of those is that eBird does not uh, give us a mechanism to record specific activity types that are engaged in by pinion jays. And uh, some examples of the more obvious ones of those activity types are listed here, caching seeds, foraging in trees or foraging on the ground, nesting, roosting, several other behaviors, and of course, flying over. Pinion jay flocks are seen as often as anything flying over a location. And we think it's important to be able to distinguish um, between locations where birds are actually using the landscape, trees and the ground, versus places that they're simply traversing in order to get from one place to another. The graph at the bottom, or the, the figure at the bottom left, dives just a little bit deeper into this question about why pinion jay activity types might be important. Now, this is just one data set. I'm not presenting it as a universal truth, but we're seeing similar patterns in many parts of the pinion jays range. What this depicts is just one variable, tree density, that might affect presence or absence of pinion jays or what they do in the landscape. And in these particular study areas, the, the bar graph across the bottom, I'm not sorry, the box plot across the bottom, more or less depicts the range of tree densities that are available to birds in these study areas. And you can see the median is right here where my cursor is, around 175 trees. I think that's per hectare, if I remember right. Um, now, if we look at occurrence records of pinion jays that are categorized by what they're doing, you see something very interesting. Um, first, each of these activity types seems to predominantly occur in areas that have somewhat different tree densities. Caching tends to occur in places with very low tree densities, foraging in places with relatively higher but still low on the general spectrum tree densities, and nesting occurs in areas that are closer to the typical tree density that's available. But what that sort of tells us is that pinion jays aren't using, at least in these study areas, all of the pinion juniper woodland. They're selecting subsets of it, and furthermore, they're subdividing the subsets they select according to their activity. If we're going to sort out what makes some places good pinion jay habitat and other places less good pinion jay habitat, it seems logical that we need to account for this sort of differential habitat use. And um, we can only do that if we record our records um, with respect to the activity types that are observed. So that's reason number one why we need to go a step beyond eBird um, in this undertaking. The second one is that it's, while possible, it's not particularly easy to generate absence data from, from eBird records. It can only occur through a processing, um, uh, a, a series of data processing steps, and it can only occur when people are making checklists in an area. And it's, you know, it's done by inference, by, by, you know, the absence of a species within a checklist. This device that I'm going to show you in just a minute um, for community science with pinion jays makes the recording of absence records far more explicit. And our ability to, um, to, to model the habitat relationships of pinion jays becomes stronger when we have uh, meaningful data, not only on where presences occur, but also where absences occur. So that's the second reason why we need to go a step beyond eBird. The third one is that, um, and this isn't really a limitation of eBird per se, but in the, in the environment that this community science um, initiative occupies that we'll see in a minute that I'll call hub, it becomes easier for us to uh, provide groups that are interested in, in having assignments to provide them with those assignments. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but in a community science framework, we can either um, simply encourage people to create uh, uh, records where they're convenient, um, or for people who want to uh, make their contribution in a bit more structured way, we can identify priority areas, areas that are of particular interest. And those assignments are much easier to provide in the environment that I'm going to show you um, than it would be an eBird. So those are three reasons why 
we're, we're going beyond eBird in this undertaking here. All right, next topic. I just briefly mentioned ArcGIS Hub. Um, what this is, is the software environment, an online environment within which the community science initiative for Pinion Jays is housed. Um, it takes the form of a website. I'll show you that in a little bit, but it's connected to underlying um, ArcGIS um, um, software resources and capabilities. And it has lots of advantage for advantages for this kind of initiative. And I've bullet pointed a few of them. I'll run through them quickly. We'll get a little bit more deeply into some of them as we go through the talk. Um, but a big advantage to this environment is that it makes it very easy for participating and collaborating groups to retain their own identity, their own branding, and furthermore, to, uh, to determine specific content or specific assignments or specific uh, products that are viewed that are, that are unique to that group. Um, we do that by assigning all of the user uh, members of a given organization into a group, and that facilitates that sort of uh, group personalization. Because all of the users are in different groups, it makes it easy to decide what part, what data, what um, data products, what information is shared with which groups. And we, of course, encourage and hope that all of the participating groups will be eager to, to share their contributions and to interact with other groups operating under this initiatives. But if there are any sensitivities or, or anything along those lines, it's quite easy to configure this system so that you can have control over what's seen by your group versus other groups. Um, next uh, advantage of this is that it's fully integrated with a series of field apps for data collection. We'll be looking specifically at one called Survey123, which is the app with which your participants will you know, go out into the field and record data on their phones or tablets. Uh, Hub was originally created um, as a sort of an open data site. So it really shines when it comes to amalgamating data from different sources for, for people to consolidate and aggregate and use to answer questions. But it also gives us the option to make data semi-open as I described before, or even protected depending on the, the preferences of the data contributors. Uh, Hub also, and it's getting better and better at this, provides sort of an online commons where participants and participating groups can, can get updates and information and can collaborate with one another and discuss things um, of mutual interest. Uh, the data that are stored um, uh, through a Hub site are all very easily accessible to GIS software. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this at one level or another, but it's, it's of course, one of the most powerful ways to visualize and um, explore data through geographic information systems. And then finally, a big advantage is that for all of the participants and data contributors, this is free of charge. The bird, my bird observatory, Great Basin Bird Observatory has, has um, subsidized the underlying cost of this software. And uh, beyond that, though, signing up for accounts, which we'll talk about in a moment, is free to the participants. To date, this initiative, um, I'd say last field season was the first sort of fully operational field season. Um, and we're, we're anticipating a lot of growth with the involvement of CFO and perhaps other organizations for 2023. This is sort of a live set of widgets from the hub site that we'll visit in a moment. Uh, at, at the time I took this screenshot, there were seven named organizations, over a thousand records, and the number of individual contributors I discovered when I made this slideshow was not updating correctly. It's actually about 189, so I will have to um, figure out why that's not updating like it's supposed to. Uh, and we're also looking to, um, to, to you know, recognize the, the major data contributors, both on an individual and group basis, as we started to do down here. Um, this just gives you a map of some of the contributed records so far and what this data look like. Um, and you can see, interestingly enough, that you know, within the Pinion Jays range, which is sort of centered on the map here, 
only I think one record from Colorado, so that will change quickly. It's one reason we're so happy to have you guys participating. Um, but some of these records are coded um, according to presence records. Somebody saw a pinion J flock, which are in red. Absence records, which are in this sort of aquamarine color. Remember, we talked about the absence records earlier, and we encourage, we'll talk about this a little more, but we encourage participants who are in potential pinion J habitat to record absence records because they are valuable. And you can see that each record, uh, this is a highlighted record right here, have data attached to them, uh, including the main activity type, which in this case was resting, um, and some other types of information as well. So this is the kind of data that we collect. Uh, get up to over a thousand of these now. As we get into the multiple thousands of these records, they become a very powerful data source. Uh, so some, some kind of dive down into a few more details of how this initiative um, can be configured uh, to, to meet the interest level, to meet the preferences, the desires and the needs of different participant groups. And we're talking here specifically about how a collaborating group can brand its um, brand and tailor its participation. So we've talked about some of this a little bit, but it's possible within the hub architecture. And again, we're gonna to go to the actual hub site in a moment. Um, and this will become a little bit more uh, real and tangible to you. But within the hub site architecture, we can create content that's only seen by members of specific groups. So that means if you guys decide that there is an announcement or a map or a set of assignments that's specific to CFO or Colorado, we can easily put that on the website and the people who see it will be the people who log in as members of the CFO group or the Colorado group. Um, you can embed elements of the hub site into your own websites if you, if, you, if you like that option. We talked before about how data can be shared and visualized in ways that are specific to groups. If you guys want a live results map, that's a, say a heat map, or that has a specific sort of base map on it about areas of interest or, or projects of interest um, to superimpose your data on, that can be, that can be put together and uh, configured so it's seen only by CFO group members. And then finally, there's the whole issue of survey design. And we, we touched on that briefly. The fundamental way that community science is done is opportunistic. People know about, your members know about this enterprise. They know about the app. They have it on their device ready to go. And when they're out in the field birding, they opportunistically record pin and J sightings or pin and J absences. That's great. That's what most of the records are. We do get some interest from some of our groups in opportunities to do more structured surveys. For instance, um, let's say that there is a proposed uh, vegetation treatment project somewhere in your area, and you reach an agreement with the agency involved to send your folks out specifically to that area to collect baseline data. Or there's a, there's a, there's a area where a conservation plan is being rewritten and the agency might want um, 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 presence and absence or baseline data for that area. If you have members who would prefer to contribute um, data in sort of a more directed, um, specifically purposeful way, and you can find opportunities to do that, that can be, that can be accommodated in this structure too. And then finally, I wanna make you guys aware of something that's coming in 2023. Um, it's not on the hub site, it's not an opportunity yet on the hub site, but we want to expand our community science options to include the ability to assess um, tree productivity with regard to cone production. One of the big concerns about the changes that have occurred in pinyon juniper woodlands um, and you know, the changes that may be related to climate have to do with declines in cone productivity. Obviously that could be important to pinyon jays. So um, we, we will, will be uh, working with partners who are knowledgeable about these things to create opportunities to survey for tree productivity, cone productivity. So that's coming soon as well. Okay, now we're going to move from this PowerPoint show over to the hub site itself. 
I'll show you some of the highlights and how your members will sign up. After that, I'll show you an on-screen version of the Survey123 app that folks will be using to actually collect data. So I'm gonna slide, easiest way to do it is just to slide this over. Uh, you guys should see, Megan, you should see Pinion J Community Science. Is that what you guys are seeing? I'm yeah. seeing so. yep, seeing it. Okay. Um, you can note the URL up here. It's easy to find if you just type in Pinion J Community Science Hub. Um, so we come to a home page here. And you'll notice here that this says sign in. This means that uh, this is just what you, this is how you come to the site if you don't have an account yet. Um, if you do have an account, you would click this and sign in with your credentials, but we'll, everybody will be going here the first time without an account. So this is what you'll see. Now, if we scroll down this page, I'm gonna skip some of it and just get to the part that's the most important, how to get involved. So the first step for everyone who wants to uh, contribute data to this initiative is to sign up. When you sign up, you'll get a free user account. You'll pick your username and you'll pick a password. Now we're encouraging people who are uh, signing up through their affiliation with CFO to pick a username that ends in underscore CFO. That helps us to keep things organized. Um, so for instance, for me, it would be Boone underscore CFO. So try to remember that when you do this, it's not a make or break thing, but it's a, it's a nice way to keep things tidy. So you will click the sign up button and you'll get this simple uh, screen right here. First name, last name, email, confirm your email and you need to accept these ESRI, the company agreements. You'll click next and you'll just go through that process um, and um, you'll be asked to select a username and a password and you'll get an email confirmation that you signed up. It's as simple as that. Once you've done the sign up, and this is the important thing, uh, you have to take a manual step. You have to contact me, all right? And I'll give you my, um, my uh, email at the end of the presentation here in order to be put into the CFO group. There's no way to do that automatically right now in this software, so we do that manually. It's, it's very fast and very easy, um, but that is the necessary step. And you'll then go to the collect data page. Uh, once you've, now let's go back. I'm just gonna do this again so you all have, have it clear. Home page. you're first gonna sign up. When you've signed up and you've emailed me and asked to be added to the group, the next page that's the most important is the collect data page, okay? This takes you through the steps that are involved in collecting data. And it recapitulates some of what I've described before. If you happen to jump to this collect data page right here, there's another sign up button in case you missed it on the home page, right? And then this gives you specifically the, the instruction to reach out to ask to become a data collector by being added to a group. So you email this address right here. You say, I've signed up. My username is blah, 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 and I am part of CFO. You'll then be added to the group. And once you're added to the group, you are almost ready to go. What you'll want to do is learn to collect data using the Survey123 app. There are two um, manuals of instructions that are given here. The first one is um, how to Install the Survey123 app on your device. It's very easy. I'll take, a, take us here so you can take a quick look at that. You see, it just gives you the steps that a lot of which I've talked about before. It talks about how to um, download the app onto your device and how to download the specific survey form that we're using for Pinion Jays. It's only, I think, three or four or five pages, something like that. And then it also, right here, gives you some instructions about the data you're going to enter. So you'll want to read this carefully. We're not gonna go over this in detail right now, but these are your basically your how-to instructions and it should only take about a half an hour to read that. If you guys arrange a training 
and on-site training, which I think has been discussed with some of our folks, they'll go through all of this with you. So um, if you do plan to attend an in-person training, um, then you can kind of defer these details until then. Uh, so we've got that set of instructions. And then we've got some, some kind of, this is more of a field manual, what you should do out in the field to look for pinion J's. So ins instructions right here for that. Now, some of this is gonna be probably updated by the time we get to the, to the field season, uh, to the spring field season. So some of this we wrote initially with Nevada in mind. So if you do see some of that, ignore that, but I have an idea that this will be nice and fresh and updated by the time a lot of your folks are in the field. By the way, I don't want to suggest that you can only collect this data during the, the breeding season. That is not the case. You're welcome to collect data at any time um, um, at all. Uh, it's valuable to get uh, year-round data on these birds because after all, they are year-round residents of the landscape. Those are the two most important parts of the hub site. You'll see that there are also some other pages, some information about pinion jays here, some survey results. This is essentially a version of the map that I just showed you um, and some other graphs. Um, and this, we're aiming to keep this fresh and updated frequently and a few other things as well. A table, you know, a page that lists some resources of interest um, like the Pinion Jay Conservation Strategy, for instance. Some interesting papers that have come out recently, that sort of thing. So that's the hub site. From here, we're gonna look at the actual Survey123 app. And uh, the Survey123 app, which is how you'll collect and record data in the field, uh, will look a little bit different on every device. Uh, it runs on um, iOS devices, on Android devices, uh, it, they can be tablets or phones, it doesn't matter. And it's all configured assuming that you're not connected to the internet when you're out in the field. So it'll look a little bit different uh, on different devices, but it'll always be similar to what you're looking at here. So you're gonna see this data form, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna start with date and time, which you can see is automatically populated um, using your device's uh, um, uh, clock and calendar. The next thing you'll enter is the time you spent at the location before you made the observation you're contributing. Now, if it's, a, if it's an opportunistic presence record, you may see pinion jays on your way to somewhere else and only have a minute to record them and that's fine. You say you spent one minute at the site. The reason why this field is important is because absence records become more and more meaningful the longer you've been in a location. So let's say you're camping um, in a in a pinion juniper woodland, and you're there all evening for two hours, and it occurs to you you haven't seen or heard any pinion jays, it's well worth your time um, and the initiative's time to enter uh, 120 minutes, and then, and so 120, and then an absence record, right? Now, I want you to, to notice that if you have recorded an absence record, there's a very small number of additional fields. You can enter comments, just general things you want to describe that you think might be of interest. And if you want to, you can also take one or more pictures of the location. That's it for an absence record. If it's a presence record, however, and let's say it's a presence record that you like what I described or you've only been there one minute, you see there's a lot more fields that suddenly pop up. You see how that changes? A presence record brings up a lot of fields that are only relevant if you've actually seen pinion jays. So you would estimate the size of the flock, 25 birds. You would choose the predominant activity type um, right here. And let's say we see birds resting in trees. Uh, and then you would enter the approximate distance from you to the flock. The reason this is useful is because this app it automatically records geographical coordinates. You don't have to do anything. That happens automatically. But it records the coordinates where you are, not where the flock is. So in order to um, um, post-process this data so it's as accurate as possible, it helps to um, describe where the flock is in relation to you. So if the flock's about 100 meters away, we'd enter about 100 meters, obviously, 
This is approximate. And you choose the direction that's the best description of the direction from you to the flock. Let's say that's east. Any, any comments you want to enter, go here. Any pictures you want to enter, go here. And then when you finished with the record, it doesn't show in this depiction. Oh, yes, it does. There's a check mark. It'll be somewhere on your device. You'll click the check mark. That will put the record in an outbox. This is all described in the instructions um, that you can get off the hub site. Now, remember, you're not connected to the internet. So submitting the record with the checkbox only puts it in an outbox on your device. When you get back home and you're connected to the internet again, you'll open the app up and you'll see your outbox and you'll just send those records up to the cloud so they join all the other data. And again, the training will go through all of this in great detail um, and the instructions go through it in great detail. But that's what the app looks like. It's, it's meant to be very simple. The records that it does um, ask you to record are, um, are um, this very similar. They're essentially the same as some of the records we record or some of the attributes we record in the more formal surveys. So they're, they're easy to integrate with those other data sets. And that's how it works. It's really as simple as that. Um, as you go along, as your group and your, your um, users get more familiar with the system, we welcome continuing conversations about how to tailor this so that it's uh, as, as interesting, as engaging, as useful to you as a collaborating group as it possibly can be. And we're more than happy to, 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 to talk with you about what's possible and, and make that happen behind the scenes. So with that said, um, I'll just go to the final slide here, which has my email address on it. It also has my colleague Ned's email address on it. He's our outreach coordinator. So if there is a training session, it's very likely that you will be talking um, with Ned at some point or meeting with him in person if he or one of his colleagues is able to go out there. So uh, feel free to reach out with any questions that may occur to you um, in the future. But for now, I am happy to answer any questions you may have. So it looks like there's several in chat and I'll, um, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask um, uh, Megan or one of the organizers to, to kind of cue those up for me. Yep, uh, Linda's going to be kind of directing those questions, but really quickly, I also want to show participants um, the a web page that's on the CFO website. So if you forget the hub, um, the hub email address or web address, and but you know the CFO site. Underneath science and research, we have our Pinion J page. It has additional information and connections to the hub, more information on how to sign up, including, I should probably make this larger so you can see it, um, including information like setting up your username with that underscore CFO, connections to these um, two, uh, two manuals. And these are just direct links to their website. So once you get here, you can get to their website as well. Um, some other information about what's coming up currently planned for Colorado, and this will probably change over time. We will also put a recording of this video here instead of register for the online meeting, we'll put up the link for the video so you can come back and see this. And we'll have some more information about where to go in Colorado as we figure that out. It's a, you know, this is a relatively new project. By next spring, we hope to have a lot more information for you uh, for where you want to survey across Colorado and, and find that pinion juniper habitat. Um, and then we have a, a map here that's static at this point, but may be able to change at some point. So again, this is on the CFO website. It's pinion J project or under science and then the research portion. So if you forget the URL for the hub, you can also come here to get all of this information. I love um, that. That's, that's great that you did that. That's, um, I'd like to see that. Yep. So Linda, go ahead and take over Q&A. You bet. And some of these have already been answered by Elizabeth with the Great Basin Bird Observatory. So thank you. Um, uh, one question was, does the app work in the absence of a cell signal? And Elizabeth uh, said, yes, it does. I don't know if there's anything more you want to add to that, John? Yeah, that is. So it's assumed um, you won't have a cell signal when you're out in the field. 
Um, and if that's the case, when you submit a record with that check mark, it goes into the outbox, essentially gets stored on your device, waiting to be sent up to the cloud. If you happen to be connected, when you press that check mark the first time, it'll just go up into the cloud, but we assume that it'll go to the outbox. So it is important occasionally when you get back from the field and you are connected to the internet to reopen the app. And it's very easy to see there's a big pile there for outbox. And one of the options for the outbox is just to send in your records. And that's how it gets up to the cloud. If you forget to do it for a day or two, no worries, it stays on your device, but you don't wanna leave them there forever. You know, if you lose your phone or something like that, then, then the record is lost, so. Great. Um, we have a question by Sally that um, Elizabeth answered as well. I noticed that your list of activity type does not include flocks at the feeders. Do you want to um, avoid observations in those situations? Um, Elizabeth you know, uh, commented, it's a good point. We probably want to add that option. That's a great point. It actually were, uh, along with a lot of other participating organizations, there have been discussions about the, the formal Pen and J survey protocol. And exactly that question came up that there were a couple of activity types that were not originally put into the activity menu, including one of them was feeders. And the other one was flying. Now, flying over means you see the birds up here, they're going from one place to another. Flying means they're using the trees and the ground within the area of your observation, but they're also flying around and landing. So there's, it's sort of a more localized version of flying. So I, I believe that we, yes, we are, we will add those two activity types to this app. Um, Elizabeth helped me remember to do that. We already added it to the other protocol and we need to do it to this one. So great observation, whoever made that. Excellent, okay. Um, next question, can we add previous sightings from our eBird? Uh, the question is yes soon, not yet. So there is an interest that's been expressed by lots of um, participants about moving their previously collected data from paper or from other systems into this. And we're actively working on that. Um, the first available option will allow you to manually enter records, say from paper into this system. Beyond that, we also hope to provide options for batch uploading so that you know if you have electronic records from a different system you'd have a pathway to get a bunch of them up into the system all at once that obviously is more involved but we're we are working on that so if you have previous records please hold on to them look for announcements through the hub site or through your local coordinators about when these um, mechanisms for contributing data become available and yes it's a very good point it's an important one and we are indeed working on it Right. I'm going to jump back to the feeder question again, because David has at, um, said my observations are also flocks at my feeders, but I'm not sure how to deal with the amount of time observing. Can it be just a general, he, he thought it might have been like 15, 20 minutes, for example? Yeah, with presence records, it's really not terribly important um, what you enter. Uh, to be honest, uh, it's much more important for absence records, but we didn't want to overly complicate it. Um, so just whatever makes sense to you for a presence record. Um, you know, if, you, if you've been spent some time observing them, um, you can just approximate that time. If you are observing, this is an important point, and it's covered in some of these instructions. If you are observing pinion jays in one location for an extended period of time, and for the first five minutes, they are resting, but then they start foraging on the ground. Um, um, our instructions suggest that you should create a new record with the new activity type because it's, you know, it's the same flock. Yes, it's not independent, but it, it records a different activity type. And in case anybody with some sort of a statistical orientation is worried about that, we recognize that, that data that are collected in the same location, you know, within close proximity to one another are probably non-independent records of the same flock that just represent different observations, perhaps of the birds doing different things. So we are cognizant of the importance of not misusing data, 
uh, in that way. So we encourage you to take as, to record as many records of a flock as you need to, to capture the range of activities that you see them doing. Okay, great. I'm gonna switch now to habitat questions. Um, what is the habitat I'm looking for? Uh, are they only around pinyon pine trees? What do they like to eat? Are they usually seen in flocks? And are they in Colorado year round? Or are they, or this person is saying they are in Colorado year round, is that correct? I can definitely answer the last one, but I, we may have folks on this call who are, um, I can't see every everybody there on, on one screen, but if, um, if Amy or Liza or somebody else is there who work, actually works on pinion jays in Colorado, um, you guys would have more um, um, regionally specific information about, about the range of habitats they use. So let me get, are either of you guys there? If not, I'll answer as best I can, but I wanna give the Colorado experts a chance to weigh in if they're around. No? Okay. Um, my answer to those- Pinyon jays, excuse me. Oh, hey, I've had my feeder, which would have been in the winter. And we know we see them in the summer. Um, okay. Southern Colorado, obviously, New Mexico's full of them, or well, more so than here, but. Right. Um, Range-wide, you know, we certainly, they are commonly associated with pinyon juniper woodlands, but you can find them in juniper woodlands, you can find them in other kinds of coniferous woodlands. And, you know, the, the way that they use this diversity of habitat seems to vary somewhat regionally. So to some extent, you'll be helping to answer that question for Colorado. Um, you know, the range of habitats they use. Uh, I touched on an observation we've certainly made in the Great Basin, which is that although pinyon jays always occur close to woodlands, they oftentimes occur well out into the shrubland or particularly in these transitional areas that are part shrubland and part woodland. So um, that's our sort of main take home message for habitat use in the Great Basin, but um, it'll be a part of, yeah, that's a good example of why collecting community science data is so valuable because it helps us get a handle on the regionally um, variable patterns of habitat use that occur across the range. Yeah, and if I can add to what John was saying, I feel like there was a lot of ponderosa pine in Colorado as well, which uh, they will also use. And they're primarily associated with pinyon pine, but uh, we have, them in Jeffrey Pine and Ponderosa Pine as well. So, you know, pine trees and and generally lower elevations is where, but, but that's what you guys are gonna find out for us um, if that is true in Colorado. Um, in the Great Basin, and it, it seems like in Arizona and New Mexico perhaps, uh, they tend to be more likely to be found in the lower elevations. Um, so none of the high, high conifers in a high altitude conifers, that's that's not really where we find them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was really an informative uh, discussion on that. Um, I'm gonna move to the next question. Um, this is from Linda Hodges. Elizabeth, I think you kind of already answered on this, but if we wanna expand on it a little bit, um, she asked, um, do you want data from any state in the Great Basin or just Colorado? And for example, if somebody signs up as a user underscore CFO, it's fine if they're going to go to New Mexico or Utah, for example, and collect data? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Anywhere, anywhere in or near the, the geographical range of the species is, is a worthwhile place to collect data. Great. Here's a good one. How, and I think more than one person, uh, no, one person. How could I donate to the project? Oh, well, uh, that, that's wonderful. There is some cost involved for us that we're subsidizing. So um, we, would, we would love to talk to people about that. So contact me or Elizabeth and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll steer you in the right direction. Or you can go to the uh, gbbo.org homepage. And if anybody does want to donate to the project, we would make sure that that only goes straight to the cost of maintaining the hub site and this data center. Yeah, and we can have that conversation with CFO on, you know, how to maybe support the volunteers. Um, that question has come up. 
you know, as far as, you know, could there be a fund that could support, you know, what you guys are doing, you know? So we can we can have that conversation and as we go. <laughs> specifically, what's something that's come up here in Nevada is that um, there is interest in some groups and some of these more directed survey assignments. And um, um, in those cases in particular, it's felt that it might be advantageous to be able to offer volunteers sort of a travel stipend or something like that to cover their mileage. So those are all things that are fair game. Um, but yeah, if people want to put resources into this, we, we want to help to make sure that it goes directly, feeds directly back into the project itself in one way or another. I'm gonna jump back to a question, I think that was up near the, at the beginning talk, and it was on the first slide. Um, talking about those, um, the, uh, what was it, the three curves that you had on that one slide and what the definition of those were? Yeah, um, the, the, that was a trend, the trend yeah. graph, John, you know, there right. was not much in the way of access labels. <laughs> so that's yeah, probably okay. why people were asking. <laughs> the line in the middle, and do you want me to bring that up again? It's easy to do. Um, Sure, I'll go for it. That up again. Let me find the right uh, share screen. There it is. And um, no, that's not it. There it is. Share. Okay, let me go back up to the first slide. Okay. Are you seeing the graph now? Yes. Okay. The line in the middle is really the more important one. And that is, it's essentially an index of population density. And it says index over here. And this isn't a depiction of exactly how many birds there are or their exact density, but you know, an index of 80 means there's about twice as many pinion jays out there on the landscape as an index of 40. So this, this, this represents the estimated change in population size over the whole range across time. These two lines, just define it, they're statistical lines. They define a confidence interval. So what that means is that in statistical terms, even though we're estimating that this is the rate of decline, the actual rate of decline could be shallower, like here, or steeper, like here, just so that it's sort of within those confidence limits. So that's what those means. That's just sort of a depiction of how certain we are that this trend is accurate. And you can see that the confidence lines themselves, they define a downward trend. So that means we're highly confident that they're declining. The exact magnitude of the decline, there's some uncertainty about, but um, that's, that's what that means. So hopefully that helps. Yep, thank you. And I think we've just about covered all the questions. I think there was one last question and I, Megan was able to answer that. Um, I do want to remind folks this is being recorded and we will be uploading it to the Colorado Field Ornithologist page and um, we'll in our next newsletter coming out we'll note that link and um, John if there's any last thing you want to add and Megan as well. There was one more question that I actually do not know the answer to um, it says. Uh, do you want us to be affiliated with an organization? Are you coordinating with US Forest Service in Colorado? And I first heard about more pinion survey work through US Forest Service staff. My understanding, although someone else from the specific committee from CFO is there's going to be a variety of different partners involved in this. Um, you know, potentially that underscore CFO should have really been underscore Colorado or something. That is just a designator for the group so that they, so that we can be kind of the information can be given to folks that are more interesting in Colorado. Um, it, it is not, it shouldn't be specific to, oh, you have to be part of Colorado Field Ornithologists. We are looking to partner with Audubon groups across the state, uh, probably Denver Field Ornithologists, probably um, any other agency or any other groups that are interested. Uh, we're already reaching out. This is definitely a, a work in project process. Um, uh, we're continuing to develop partnerships and this will be a multi-year project most likely. Um, so things will, new information will be coming out. We'll have more information about where to survey, how surveys can happen. You are welcome to start to sign up and start putting data in um, from when, wherever you are and where you're out in the habitat. 
Um, but we will also be providing more information. If you're not sure where to find that information, that data will be or information will be coming out in the next few months as we continue to work with partners and figuring out how to do that all here in Colorado. So we really intended this, this uh, presentation to be an introduction and to let you know how to initially get involved. Uh, but it will be a, a long process and, and uh, more information will be coming out in, in coming months and before next year. Although, as John pointed out, this is not breeding season only, um, but we'll, we'll have more information before the next breeding season. And that's uh, you guys um, in conversation with your partners in Colorado um, can and should figure out sort of um, how you want to, it, you're, you could have people um, joining the most, the finest grain group that applies to them, like Denver field ornithologists. And you could sort of create a Colorado specific collaboration. And, you know, the, the reason to do that is if you envision a situation where you want the ability to interact with or share things with um, your smaller group and your more inclusive Colorado-based group. Um, so you can envision it however you want to, and it's not set in stone. It can change over time. It's easy to move people from one group to another one from, from our end as you figure out what you want. So um, just keep in mind that those options exist. Don't worry too much about how you structure it right away because we can refine it um, as time goes by to, to, to reflect the way you want to operate, essentially. It looked like one other question popped up, um, but I couldn't catch what it was. Yes, we actually had a question. Somebody had mentioned that um, I had uh, pinion jays nesting in my yard last year. How do I record that on the app? So if we're talking about data that um, are you're not collecting contemporaneously, um, we will have a mechanism within the next, possibly within the next month, definitely within the next two months, where you can go to the hub site. You guys at CFO may just want to provide a link to this as well on your own website um, once it's in place and live. And you can get a form very much like the one that I showed you that you, that you access through your computer and you enter your data retroactively through that. One difference that that will have is that it will have explicit fields for you to record coordinates in, right? When you're using the Survey123 app in the field, the coordinates, the latitude and longitude get recorded automatically and you never even have to worry about it. But if you're talking about a record that exists on paper or in your memory, you have to explicitly um, you have to explicitly uh, enter it. The other option, if you can go stand in the place where you saw the historical record, right? Like it's in your yard. If you still have access to your yard, which I assume is the case, you can just walk out to the yard, open the app, record the sighting as if you're seeing it right then, but then go to the top of that form and change the date appropriately. Okay, that'll work just fine as well. But you have to be, to do that, you have to be able to be standing in the place where the observation occurred. Otherwise, you'll have to go through this web-based form where you can enter the coordinates manually. Or we may, we'll likely try to, I don't know if this will happen on the first iteration, but we'll likely try to put a map on that too, so that you can actually put a pin where the observation was if you, if you didn't write down coordinates or find it more uh, easier to, to navigate on a map and stick a pin on the map. So we're sort of working through all of these different retroactive data entry options in, in sort of order of simplicity, right? One by one. Great, that's really good to know. Um, and I, Megan, I don't know if you have anything else you wanna add? I just wanted to thank everyone for coming to the presentation tonight. Um, I hope that all or some of you are interested in volunteering and doing some of these surveys. Uh, like I said, this is an introduction and can you can get more, you hopefully got more information about how you can sign up, but we will continue to be providing updates through, you know, our typical channels of social media, the Coburn's email list. And, and, and other avenues. So hopefully if you're interested, you'll be able to connect with us. You can send us questions through the website anytime if you have questions about how to participate. 
but we will be continuing to provide updates throughout the upcoming year. So thank you. And thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yeah. We really appreciate um, the, this presentation, this introductory presentation. We'll definitely have some trainings coming up. And um, thank you to everybody. It's great to see how many people were interested in this project. Um, I think we're going to show up strong here in Colorado. So too. And uh, again, uh, many thanks for, 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 for CFO's interest and for doing such a, already such a great job of facilitating, sort of uh, joining the collaboration and getting things going. So I think 2023 will be a really productive year. Sounds great. Right. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody.